is retired chairman of the Illinois Soybean Association and local farmer, Mr. Ron Moore. Good morning, Ron. Good morning, Vanessa. How are you, sir? I'm good. Life good. is good. The sun is shining, so that's a good thing. It is a good thing. And you had a chance this week, of course, to join RFD, give us the Crop Watcher report. Yes. So uh, feeling pretty good? Yeah, I, you know, our crops look good. Um, we started planting soybeans April 12th and then um, had lots of rain in April and beginning of May. And we would plant for two days and then wait for five days because it was too wet. And um, But we finished up planting corn uh, a week ago Monday and then finished uh, replanting some soybeans on Tuesday. Oh, you did have to replant some soybeans. We had about 20 acres that we had to replant it had ponded and held the water in some of our fields. and um, But they're emerged now, and if we don't get goose drowners in the next week or so, they should be okay. Yeah, it's been interesting because further south, Roseville, Macomb, you guys tend to get a bit more of, of the rain, especially yeah. the gully washers. Yeah, yeah. And we, it was kind of hit and miss with us in Monmouth. Yeah, and we farm about 15 miles from one farm to the other, and there's quite a bit of difference between the north and the south fields that we have. So um, not always uh, we're ready to plant on the north, and it rains too much and doesn't rain in the south. So that makes it challenging to get everything done on time. Well, I'm glad you were able to get most of everything you needed to done on time. Yep. So because we got to have you next week at Freezing for Food. No, I plan on being there. We have a lot to talk about today. Uh, let's start with the farm bill. Sure. Kind of give us your take on the farm bill and, and what's happening so far. Well, I, from all the reports that I've read and talked to folks, it was a very positive for agriculture. The, the, pass, the farm bill passed out of the House Ag Committee. Um, I'm a little concerned that there was some challenges to the SNAP program that might not um, might not pass when they, that bill gets over into the Senate. Um, it's just, I've always been a believer that it's okay to keep the, the nutrition program and the farm bill because, you know, what better place to have nutrition programs in a bill that helps support farmers but also helps support people who need that extra assistance through the nutrition program. And so I think it's critical that we keep it together and try to avoid um, making massive cuts to, to the nutrition program. And even though, you know, from a, from a con taxpayer's perspective, it's somewhere 70 to 80 percent of the budget for the farm bill is in the nutrition programs. And so um, some people would say it's it's not really a farm bill, it's a nutrition bill with the farm uh, support programs in place, but um, I think it's, it's very synergistic to have both of them together. Okay, and of that 70 to 80 percent, the remainder, which is with the uh, farmer portion of this, right. is really about that crop insurance. <laughs> well, it's crop insurance, conservation programs. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that at least the soybean industry has been asking for for the last you know, decade or so is a doubling of the market facilitation program and the market access program. And those are dollars that go to agricultural groups that help promote exports of U.S. agricultural products overseas. Um, and their uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s was the last time they were increased. And so uh, as we look at, at least in the soybean industry, 60% of the soybeans that we raise in the United States go into the export market, it's critically important that we continue to have those dollars that we can promote U.S. soybeans and other U.S. ag products overseas. Yes. We need to elevate our game on a global perspective. We... Uh, we see the reports yesterday, I believe it was uh, Japan announced their huge, um, uh, th the new engine mm. um, that they are coming out with in vehicles, right. sort of like a hybrid, like their original Prius that meets certain climate change standards. We have this legislation in their hands, but it hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Um, I think there's, you know, anytime we talk about, oh, being more conserving and there's always going to be some lag time on the innovations and technology that that come about um, it's 
it's critically important that we do everything we can to reduce and preserve our natural resources. Mm -hmm. And it's that's why we're hoping that the Next Generation Fuels Act uh, could actually happen so we can compete with uh, yeah. Toyota and, and uh, uh, Japan. Yep. Uh, because what was that called? The Kaylee, do you remember the name of the engine? It's called the... Um, the renew or something like that, but uh, it's it's a uh, it's a mixture of like we've been talking about. Right. So yeah, and so there's going to be new technologies yeah. come come down and be developed over the next few years, um, and so we we have to be kind of cutting <laughs> cutting edge on those as well. Yes, and hopefully we'll be able to do that. And the exports of U.S. soybeans, uh, key and vital. Are there any? Emerging markets that you're aware of, Ron? Yeah, I mean, China has been the big market for U.S. soybeans over the last few years. But as tariffs have been put on China, they've cut back on it. They've used some of their dollars to invest in uh, infrastructure and, and activities in South America uh, to, and avoiding U.S. Um, soybeans and U.S. corn. But the, some new emerging markets are in Africa. Um, they're increasing their standard of living. Um, I know there are some uh, projects in Africa to, to increase production of poultry and uh, aquaculture over there. And so when those folks are able to increase their standard of living, they're going to want to eat a higher quality of meal. And so that's encouraging. Uh, we just have to be cautious that China is also working in Africa, too, and so we need to make sure that those dollars, the uh, MAP and the FMD programs, are, are doubled so we can continue to compete with, with the, uh, the Chinese market. Sure, sure. And Illinois Soybean Association, that's what they are doing as well as working with other commodity groups and the national organization yep. with the American Soybean Association right. to, yep. to improve those efforts. Yep, absolutely. It, you know, it's... Illinois Soybean has been doing those kind of uh, projects for, you know, for 20, 30 years. And so it's, it's important that we have those local farmers to go over and talk about what we can do for customers overseas. Yeah, and you've been overseas. And speaking of uh, Japan and China earlier, you've seen some of the uh, unique technology that has been shown to the public. Yep. And it is impressive. Yeah, it, it is very impressive. Um some of the things that we've seen over in, in China was <clears throat> some of the technologies that you're using in aquaculture where in the past they would have near shore aquaculture cages and the amount of pollution that was in the, the near shore for raising fish was pretty disturbing. Um, and so what had you know, folks of the, some of, I think the University of Alabama and the University of Auburn um, develop what they call pond raceway, which circulates the water, and it it comes at, at all the sediment, the the fish poo, so it's lack of a better, <laughs> is is captured and then used as fertilizer out on the fields, and so it's very similar to what we're doing on our livestock operations where we capture the animal waste and use it for fertilizer on our fields. And so um, that technology has, has increased their production, and they're also buying soybean meal to feed those fish, so it's a kind of a win-win. They get a better quality fish, and they're using U.S. soybean meal in the process. Didn't you also see a robot playing a game? Oh, yeah, that, that technology is wild. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's not something that we're going to do here in, in the United States very soon, but those kind of technologies are you know, they're out there. I mean, there are um, robots out in the fields now that will spray a, a weed, and you have to have multiple of them instead of just one big sprayer. Right. Um, but if you're having difficulties with labor, then that's something that might be a, an option. And it's not its not really, to me, in my way of thinking, it's not really for large-scale row crop production. It's more for vegetable production, um, higher-value higher, higher value, uh, food products. 
Okay. And it will be very important with the programs, the exports, uh, the conservation efforts of that farm bill. Those are going to be key because you're feeling with legislation continually passing, and we're going to talk about that uh, now as well, the conservation efforts from legislative perspectives are becoming more and more increasingly um, required. Right. And so you, you're going to need some of these mandates. You're going to need to be able to provide. They need to maybe look at some revenue to help get those done. Yeah, and, and, and there's lots of conservation efforts that need to be done out in the countryside. My, my argument has always been there's so much need out in, in farm country that there's not enough contractors to get all of the work done. I mean, we have some really good contractors in, in this area, um, but there's just more that, more work that needs to be done. Okay, and how do we get more contractors? This is like every industry needs more people yeah, in the field. Yeah, um, I don't know. Um, it's you got to have people who have a passion for running a backhoe or running a bulldozer or a dirt scraper. Um, and they're out there. Yeah. Um, they just have to have, but it's just like everything, um, the equipment cost has gone, has just skyrocketed. So that's, sure. that's a, a barrier to entry for some of these people who want to start their own contracting business. Yes. Uh, well, hopefully we can get more people into that trade as well. Yep. Well, Ron, um, it's 8.55 uh, already. We want to talk about this legislation on carbon capture. Sure. Uh, tell us all about it. What you know? This is new legislation. Um, well, it's it's one of those complex issues that's hard to hard to know exactly what the correct answer. Um, also, obviously, the federal government is pushing um, carbon sequestration and carbon capture and those types of of, of policies. Um, but you've had companies like ADM have been pumping CO2 underground for uh, several years. I can't tell you how many years, but they've been doing it in Decatur, as I understand. Um, but now there's a big push to, to tie some of these pipelines from ethanol plants um, to, to also pipe that CO2 into underground storage areas. Um, you have to have the right geological fa uh, formations to, to do that. And there's only certain parts of the United States that have those geological um, specifications. So the, the problem I see with the carbon pipelines is this legislation has removed some of the language that has been used to prevent pipelines from getting approval here in Illinois. And they've removed that that language, but also put in some language that allows these companies that want to put a pipeline in to use eminent domain to go through farmland property, um, which to me is a little concerning. Um, I don't believe that a, a for-profit company, and that's what these companies are, for-profit companies should be able to use eminent domain um, to, for, to tell me that they're going to have to go through my property with a pipeline when I may or may not want them to do that. Um, and so that's where it, this whole issue is very complex. If you want to take this step, uh, another step, what if eminent domain is used on someone who wants to put a wind farm in or a solar farm on, and I have no right of refusal f to keep them from using my property that way. Um, it's, it's one thing to use it for building a highway or, or something like that, um, but it, it's, it's uh, when you're gonna use for-profit companies are going to use eminent domain to get what they want done, I think that's a really big problem. Well, when you're talking about a for-profit company, that's their job is to get profits. Right, and if, if you know, if they're wanting to, to do something that's going to earn money, then they, they to me, they got to pay a higher than going rate for the property or the right to go through my property. Sure. So you're feeling like a door gets opened. Yeah. It's different when you're talking to a utility company, uh, per se, who's, who's 
you know, looking to make sure everybody's paid, but right. not necessarily a for, I mean, they are for profit, uh, depending on how you look at it. Right. But um, do we have this, this capability in our area to store the carbon? As I understand it, no. Okay. Um, so this affects Southern Illinois more. Well, so there's some areas in Southern Illinois and some in Northern Illinois, as I understand it. Okay. Um, but the big issue is, is a lot of the CO2 coming from the ethanol plants are in ethanol plants in, in Iowa and North Dakota and, and South Dakota. Um, and so there's a, there's a feeling that why should we let people go, let pipelines go through Illinois that's not going to necessarily benefit Illinois farmers. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to benefit farmers in another state and so that's that's one argument against uh, ha allowing the pipelines to come in. Okay. What would be the value and the benefit if the pipeline did get up and going? What's what's the best benefit for farmers or for Well, to me it's that that and and this this is such a new thing and we've been talking about it for a couple of years mm -hmm. and I I asked somebody if they knew how many there were at one point there were three pipelines being proposed and I asked somebody how many tons of carbon would those pipelines sequester pump under the ground in a year and this fella didn't know so I did a search on my on the internet and you know that's always subject to not having accurate information so I, you have to understand that but I found out that the three pipelines that were being proposed a couple of years ago would sequester 39 million metric tons of carbon a year. That's a lot of carbon. I, I can't tell you how many, you know, gasoline-powered engines that, that would take off the road, so to speak. Um, but when, when you look at what the carbon offsets that they're offering farmers right now, that's... 10 to $20 per ton of carbon sequestered on my farm. Um, I'm, there's not, I don't think you can sequester enough carbon to become close enough to uh, 39 million metric tons of carbon through a pipeline. But again, they're not asking to go through my property. And so right. that's, a, it's, it's a totally different situation. Um, and, you know, it, it's, each individual farmer or landowner has to decide whether they're willing to do that. Um, and there's there's benefits and there's, you know, detriments to having a pipeline go through your property. Sure. Well, everybody's trying to learn and understand what all this new legislation yep. means. Uh, carbon capture, sequestration, what's in it for farmers, what's in it for the environment, what's for sure, who gets the credits. Have they determined any aspect of credit back to the farmers yet? Not that I'm aware of. Um, and this leg legislation, we should point out, is proposed, and even if it were to pass, still wouldn't go into effect for two more years. There's yeah. more discussion they want to have about it. So right. they are they are looking into it. Yeah, and, and but it's new legislation, and so um, the problem I see with the state legislature is things get done at the 11th and a half hour, and then there there's not enough time for the people to gain enough knowledge to know whether they're for or against some of this legislation that that gets passed that's a that's a problem yeah you're talking about the budget they got passed oh, at the 4 budget, again. yeah <laughs> and there's been several other things that you know they sure. just pass at two o'clock in the morning and nobody has a chance to really read the legislation or argue against it so they almost need more time throughout the year yeah you know, uh, rather than push come to shove and the, and, you know, the 11 o'clock hour, like you say, almost need to go to work every day, eight to five and right. take vacation time yeah. twice a year. And <laughs> does that sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Seven day a week job, isn't it? Right. Right. Okay. How do the commodity groups unite and work together uh, regarding this legislation? Well, that's a challenge, but the, the, the first thing we have to do is all communicate with each other. I know, um, considering this carbon uh, pipeline legislation, I know a couple of organizations that are uh, opposed to it, predominantly because of the use of eminent domain. Um, 
But I think there's other ways to accomplish this pipelines without using eminent domain mm -hmm. to force people into doing something they don't want to do. Um, and yeah, the, my understanding of the eminent domain law is you have to be paid fairly, fairly for compensation, but um, sometimes the compensation isn't what it should be to allow somebody to go through your property. Yeah, okay. Anything else you want people to know? Uh, no, other than this is a, a great time of the year to watch new crop in the ground and emerging and new baby calves. And Aww. and so that's always fun to watch. So You got baby calves? Uh, no, but my nephew does, and I was over to his place, and he's got some newborn calves running around. So that's kind of nice to see. Oh, that is nice to see. Love, love cows. I, Kaylee loves cows. I think she needs to go do a live broadcast over at your nephew's house. Ah. Get some video of those calves. Yeah. Kaylee, did you have anything for Ron this morning? No? Okay. Ron, thanks so much hey, for coming no in. We'll, and we'll see you next week at Halfway to Freezing for Food. Yep. And uh, good luck with your crop. All right. Thank you much. Ron Moore with us, past Illinois Soybean Association chairman, as well as American Soybean Association chairman.